Uh, the making of Yes songs as a film came about when I guess we had a desire and we did some shopping and it so happened that my, my brother Philip uh, is still a film editor. He had a um, he was part of a team of people called A1 OK Productions. I think pretty much the idea must have come from Steve's brother talking with Steve and you know and how he was involved with these people making a film and so he said why don't we, why don't we make a film of us? Peter Neal, the director, uh, was was very competent and had, you know, had a vast experience. And, and uh, David Speech, I think, was the producer. And as I said, Phil was was the editor. So there was a sort of team. It came about to pass that a few meetings went down and the guys met these people and said, well, like, you know, we're going to do a show at the Rainbow, as it was called then, and uh, let's film that show. Well, all this seemed like a, uh, a regular, regular event, but the thing was, one's got to remember that besides the short promotion films that had been made with Yes, really Yes had never seen themselves, you know, perform. They'd seen themselves mime, they'd seen themselves pose, but actually, performance is quite different. You, you can get quite attached to the way that you play and the way that that's interpreted. Yeah, I mean, we were pretty much, you know, uh, naive to, you know, being filmed and, you know, I don't even know if we had makeup. I don't think we did. <laughs> We just went on stage and played, and someone pointed the camera at us. And uh, you know, we, as I said, we were very much in our developmental stage, and um, you know, we were, you know, just learning the ropes, really. I think it's a true piece of rock and roll because at that time, you know, we were still heading in this era where we were thought of as a great people's band. We, we were a voice for that time. You know, they hadn't got to call us rock dinosaurs and we hadn't looped it with decades of music and tours. You know, there was still something wet behind the ears about the group. And uh, I relish to, to indulge in that kind of a moment because after all, it's kind of what it's all about really, because no matter, you know, all these experiences we have, and as I said, some of them aren't, aren't always good. Uh, they scar you a little bit and they scar your memory of things but I think to know that in, in 1972 we walked on stage there with that lineup that at that time could play our music so spontaneously almost you know things like I've seen a good people the end the end part of that song it's a big sound for five people to make you know it's uh, it, it works it's 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 got a lot of great texture and and at the time, Rick was playing a wonderful Hammond organ, you know. If you're near the band, it's great. If you see them on film, I think Yes Songs is a brilliant film. It's a, it was one of the most successful documentaries of its time, I think. Um, it's a great film. But the experience in the theatre isn't the same as watching the film. You don't get the cuts. You don't get the different perspectives. You don't get the close-ups. You get one view, and if you're far back, you can't really see their faces. Technology meant back then that you could hear them very well but you couldn't necessarily see them and uh, uh, even very flamboyant characters like Rick Wakeman w was tied into place by his equipment. You couldn't make this film now, it wouldn't exist. 
it's the kind of film that doesn't exist. A, you've got a young man who, who went on to do great things, obviously, as we did, but we're at a kind of nucleus and embryonic stage where we, we're just about creating this, you know, what's become a lifelong career for, for most of us. Very nice, thank you. The next little tune I'd like to dedicate to the person that it was written for is a little boy called Dylan somewhere, and this tune came about because it's just about one day old. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, this that I won't actually remember. And the opportunity it gives us to see this youthful, vibrant group, um, you know, pre uh, Thousand Telegraphic Oceans, pre Relaya, you know, it, it, it's, it's going to be quite magic, and, and I look forward to it. Bill was mischievous, he was all over the place. He fantastically invented drummer. And you, you couldn't see that. You could hear it, but you couldn't see it. So, as my brother and I were, were, were enjoying the experience of being there, because we could go where we wanted, backstage, all around the auditorium, what was becoming more and more clear to us is that from the audience perspective, they needed a, a much more theatrical event than just the music. Uh, Mike Tate's lights were very good. He was a good lighting guy. But he only had the band to illuminate, and, and there were serious limitations with how to light the band. Basically, what happened was, although the making of the film wasn't that problematic, we, uh, you know, they, they did the filming. You know, all we did was stand there and play. And then the mixing was, was deemed to be very, very important. Not only the album, Yes Songs, the triple album live, was deemed to be as important as a studio record, which later in, in my career, I found out very few people agree with that. And in fact, a lot of live mixing is treated like a you know, a secondary important thing. You know, oh, it's got live sound, okay, fine, just leave it. Um, because the agony to go back and remix it means you have to be very, very dedicated and, and you, you have to take time, as much time as you would on a studio record to really get this right. Well, crazy as we might have been, Eddie Offord and the band sat down in AdVision Studio 2 uh, and mixed this like a serious project, you know. Everything was done, the edits were carefully prepared, you know, the, the, the show took a lot about a lot of scoping, the CD, or the record as it was. But of course the show, this was a one-off show and we didn't change any audio from the original night, so this was live audio. We were at that stage of our career where, you know, the Yes album had been very successful and fragile and close to the edge. And, um, of course, I believe, yeah, Yes Songs has Bill Bruford and Alan White playing drums on it. So uh, that was unique in, in itself, really, that, that there was, you, we had an album with two different drummers. And 
I, I, I guess it was kind of unique also that uh, Atlantic put out a triple album. I don't think there had been many done before that, or if any. Maybe we were, you know, just ahead of the game then. I mean, this was before, you know, a lot of the great live acts like Bruce Springsteen, etc. You know, had I think had probably even made live albums. So, you know, I think we were probably just a bit ahead of the game on on the making of a live album, and of course, um, filming it as well. You know, sort of added to the um, dimension. Well, what happened with Yes Song's music was the same as the mixing for the film. We, we took it rather too seriously, and we did a brilliant job. Eddie, Eddie persisted, and we did three albums of mixing for, for that, so that it was, I mean, in a way, as I say, we never did that again. Uh, yes Shows was done with some perfectionism, with Chris and Eddie Offord, but with, uh, with the team that we had uh, doing Yes Songs, uh, it was an ocean of music, three albums. So we had uh, more or less all the music we'd done up until that point was, was included. Yeah, we were just, you know, right uh, in the middle of our rise to fame. And so obviously it was a, a good time for us and, uh, and uh, people got I think new people who hadn't bought any of the studio albums yet went and bought that uh, because, once again, they were getting almost like three albums worth of material in one. It paid off because that was one of the biggest selling albums we had in the early years in Germany. And they went through the roof. Germany became a very infamous um, uh, country for live music very popular, and Yes Songs was, was the big one for us. So we were very thrilled that it sold a million copies. And, uh, you know, we got all the gold albums for Yes Songs. Uh, you know, I think that a lot of the accountants were probably saying, oh, we can't have this uh, triple album, triple gatefold cover, and with all this artwork. And but he overrode the objections and said, no, we, we want to go ahead with this. And of course, for the buying public, it was great to be able to get something that was quite so intricate and um, had so much of uh, Roger's art as well floating around. So I think people bought it for a lot of reasons. Uh, I remember that um, it was particularly successful in Germany and um, uh, we were talking about Phil Carson before in the other room. I remember him telling me, oh yeah, your crowd loves the your triple album. <laughs> When we got on stage, we tried to make it better than the record, not just taking second best view on it and just saying, well, we can't do that, we can't do this, we'll just do it like that. We were kind of very vigilant to make sure that we could perform that music as well as we, we brought something to it, I think, in the performance that was convincing. And that was our, our love for the music itself. And so, you know, the band was uh, really getting very well oiled and, uh, you know, enjoying the whole playing live process, really. A deal was brokered where we would uh, receive, you know, an incredible amount of money. And unfortunately, we only got one tenth of that money. So we signed a deal for the film, 
and the film went off and these people owned it and we got the first instalment. Thank you very much, one tenth of the money. Uh, where's the next tenth? Or the next tenth, or actually, no, where's the other nine tenths? And we never received this money. And as the 70s rolled on, a, um, a disaster happened because obviously we let six years go by. You know, we let people change jobs. Managers came in and people left and every, the whole world changed. And yet we still never collected the advance on the film. We never have done. <laughs> Beginnings is part of the same era, that's for sure. And uh, even though I can almost, would have almost forgotten, but I mean, the same people did it, you know, because my brother must have done that. <laughs> was great fun and, and Patrick Moraz gave a lot to that, that performance where we did a duet of uh, a big orchestral piece, we did it as a duet and that's quite a special thing to do and I, I'd like to thank Patrick for that, very kind. I had been training to design furniture, uh, not furniture, architecture. I wanted to design buildings, but my buildings were so radical that the institutions of the time weren't buying it. They were worried about whether people would like them, they were worried about how much they would cost or even if they could be built. I had this notion that if I design something in the public field, like album covers, I could, as it were, develop an audience for my work. And so I, I, I got together a, a portfolio and I went around knocking on doors, you know. How else do you get work? And one of the doors I knocked on was Phil Carson. Roger came on board uh, with the Fragile album in um... 71 and um, that uh, uh, his original album sleeve for us was uh, I'm pretty sure something he'd already uh, drawn and uh, and we he went into Atlantic Records as far as I can remember and um, met with the aforementioned Phil Carson uh, uh, just to you know as he was um, a budding album cover designer and so he went in and showed his work and um, Phil said oh well I've got a band just finishing an album in the studio right now so um, why don't we uh, go over there and see if they like, like your work. Phil Carson was really great, he, he was very enthusiastic. Um, he said, I, I, I'd love to use your work, but I've only got two bands and they've both got albums out, and, 
But I'll tell you what, as soon as one of them needs a cover, I'll call you. And the two bands he had were Led Zeppelin and Yes. And um, he called me when Yes were going into the studio on, with the Fragile album. Went and saw them. And it was an interesting thing for me because I didn't sell them on a picture. I sold them on an approach, which was a book and a story. But it, it, was, it was great. It was a great working relationship. Good for me. That was the start. And so that was pretty much like that. They went from the office to the studio, which wasn't far. And, and that's how we met Roger, and we really liked um, the Fragile cover. And then, so Close to the Edge was the first custom cover that Roger did for us. And, um, you know, that worked very well. And um, then, of course, Yes Songs was the third. So. You know, we were getting used to the partnership by then, of, um, and the, the public seemed to like you know, the marriage of our music and his art. Well, yeah, I mean, Roger's an intrinsic part of Yes. I mean, he's almost another member. Roger Dean's artworks had a tremendous effect on us. It's, it, it's been supportive, it's been um, consistent, you know, and it, it, it explores something similar to what we do. We explore musically. But he's always exploring this terrain, you know, what kind of terrain, whether you can have, you know, an island that isn't supported, whether you can have water dripping over something and it's not an ocean, you know. So he, he loves the contradictions in, his, in the visual world. Uh, and I think that's what, yes, music is founded on as well. It's about not conforming, you know, not having restrictions and, and having a sort of like completely open palette. People ask me if I paint the music and I, I don't. What I try and do is I try and tap the same ideas that are inspiring the band. And the only way I can do that is to talk to them. And I'm, I'm never trying to get a precise interpretation of what they're, what's inspiring them. I, that, I don't believe that's even possible. What I'm trying to do is get into the atmosphere of it or, you know, an approximation of it, if you like. And the way I, the way they were talking, made me think in terms of um, more of a story than of a, 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 a few lines in a song. It was, it was the hint of something bigger. Of course, not only, you know, what people think of as the stage, uh, as the album sleeves, but obviously the staging came into play quite early on. Tales from Topographic Oceans, just after Yes songs, was the first time we. We took on a stage as well, and that happened in 2003, 2004, when we had these, we jokingly called it the sort of cow tour, where there was lots of black and white kind of stretchy objects going on. And, now, Roger's been a great, funny, great friend and uh, somebody who's, uh, whose heart's in the right place, but also he's able to tolerate some of the difficulties of working with a band like Yes, which is multiple managers, multiple record companies, which of course very close to what he deals with, multiple members. Well, my involvement with Yes Songs was um, complex. Um, first of all, I did the most elaborate and complex package I'd ever done. It was three albums and a book. And that was an incredible experience because it took that original fragile idea beyond close to the edge and into a real s sequence that implied a story. went on tour with the band and I'd seen them in concert but we went on tour with them in the band. My brother photographed them for the book and I went with him as his assistant really and it was fascinating to watch them. It was fantastic 
And it was also an incredible education in what they were as a theatrical experience. We didn't talk a great deal until I'd actually come to them with the painting of that blue mushroom city and that spiral foreground place. And it was very radical for them at the time. I, the, the reaction, my recollection, God, I hope it's true, but my rec recollection of it was that they were really knocked out by that. They thought it was an amazing piece. And then having it as a sequence, the culmination of a sequence of four paintings that linked it to the earlier, yeah, I think it went down well. Of course, style is style. Style, fortunately, is a strength. Uh, and it runs through the things we do. And, and that's why Fly From Here as an album is very important. It obviously harks quite a bit onto drama because of the lineup and Trevor's involvement as well. Besides 90125, where, you know, I can't speak much about it because I wasn't there. But uh, basically, the, the, the cohesion of friends, a teamwork, you know, it's all about that. And I think Roger usually admits that although he's had a fairly free reign on, on quite a few sleeves, at times, like Tales, uh, it was a collaborative thing. He, he was sorting out some of our issues by including things we wanted. I think of both music and art as a, essentially a gift culture. That doesn't mean it's free, although a lot of people do think it should be. It means, I mean, if you bought a gift for somebody, you wouldn't expect it to be free. It's a gift, but you would buy it. So it's, it's a gift culture, but not free. But the, the importance of that is that how can you make a gift of music? You can make a gift by ticket to an experience, but to, to give somebody music that will keep that vinyl album in its package was a thing. And it was, it contained the music in a way that a download just can't. So no matter how much access you give someone to music, it's not the same as giving them a thing, a gift, something you can wrap up something that will be a joy beyond the musical experience. So I really saw it as a gift. That's the job, is to make it a whole. Music and everything about it should be a joy, a gift. Um, and it would be a perfectly wonderful gift. I mean, giving somebody yes songs, somebody's aunt or mother giving a child yes songs would have been perceived as a fantastic thing. Not just for the art, of course. In fact, because of the music, but because of the way it came. When Close to the Edge came out in CD for 10 years, the painting that everyone loved about Close to the Edge packaging was not in the CD. They only printed the cover in colour and the inside was black and white. I mean, that really showed that they had no respect for the customer, no respect for the music, really, no respect for the project and no self-respect. And I, I really feel that um, the last 20 or 30 years have been a very slow 
considered suicide by the record companies. They've really let themselves down very badly. And they deserve downloads. But I think, you know, there is signs of people re acquiring that territory of making the record, the music experience, back into a gift. Uh, for example, the last two Yes albums, the one that came out in the summer, the la their latest studio album, is av available in a box set which has a gatefold vinyl and a CD, um, both in the same package. Other bands are putting access to downloads with their vinyls. And Yes's latest um, live album, Live in Leon, is, is coming into vinyl. So the idea of it being a gift and taking care of everything, and making it a desirable object or an object of desire, is coming back. And the bad time, really. Over the years, there have been times when we've had discussions, I've run ideas, they've chosen this, chosen that. Some have wanted to have more of an input than others. Um, by and large, though, they've been very supportive, and if I'd gone in with a strong idea, very rarely did I go away and rethink it, you know. John might say, can you put a few birds in the corner or something like that, but it's pretty much what it was. There's a, a painting of mine, which is sort of chunks of rock floating in the sky, and the big rock has a tree on it and a pool and stuff like that. And that was the sequel to the Yes Songs album, where there's a, a chunk of planet breaking up and going through space. It lands on a new planet. It sort of bursts into life and becomes a city in the background. And then I took the penultimate of that sequence and imagine it being eroded away so it was actually floating in space. This lump of land was floating, in, not in space, but in midair. And I went to Montreux where they were recording Going for the One and I thought this is perfect for Going for the One. I just really thought it was um, spot on. But when I got to the studio, John was already painting a cover. Excuse me, and he told me what he wanted. I said, well, John, obviously, you know, you can have what you like, but I have a different idea. He didn't want to see it and I don't think I ever showed it to the band. So that's, that's happened. Um, it happened on magnification. Um, that was even stranger. I sent them, I sent them a bunch of, I the band, a bunch of ideas for magnification. I was talking to them about it and I did it via their management company and the management company had a notion they wanted someone else to do the cover so they didn't forward my, my, my designs. So that was, that, that Things have happened. It's not been a smooth relationship. It's mostly it has, but you know, I mean, my relationship with Yes is pretty much the same as every other member of the band. It's been <laughs> good times and bad. Mostly good though. And good for me, and I hope my work has been good for them. The main thing with me, my whole life has been improvising, because improvising is a way that you write music really. You know, you improvise some stuff, you don't know what you're doing, listen to it back and you think, oh, that's good, this bit here, I've always wanted to do things like that. So you take it out and you create music to grow from that. So 
the main thing for me is that songs that gave me improvisational space, like Perpetual Change, um, Yours Is No Disgrace, Close to the Edge was one of the greatest. I mean, Bill, Chris and I sat in Advision Studios and, you know, we counted that one, two, three, four, five, six, and we started playing. I mean, we had practiced certain parts of it, but a lot of it was completely uh, just blown, you know, just, just off the top of our head. And um, that makes me proud, not because of my ego says, oh, that's good, but just because that's really what music's about, the creation, you know. Reinterpreting, reperforming is, is lovely. But when you get the chance to improvise, for me, that, that's an added bonus because now I can draw from improvisation, but I don't have to play every note, and rarely do I. McCartney was a great influence on my bass playing, as was Bill Wyman, as was Jack Bruce, and of course the late John Entwistle um, was a huge influence on me. Of course The Who were my favourite band when I was um, 16. Uh, you know, I used to go to the Marquee and watch them every week, where they had a residency there. So. Um, yeah, so I, I, it was, that was, uh, you know, a great time for me being a young musician and, and having so many influences that were all doing great but different things. So I think I borrowed a bit from all of them. Oh, wow, it was f sort of fantastic around then. I mean, that was, you know, the Sgt. Pepper days. And, and uh, you know, the, so it was a great time to be uh, involved in creativity because it seemed like everyone was so um, well stoned for one. But uh, apart from that, you know, the possibilities of being able to, you know, let, let your imagination roam and you know, and the, and the boundaries surrounding. Uh, you know, the three-minute pop song even went, went away and allowed us to expand, you know, into 20-minute long pieces. I do have a quest, you know, a thirst, if you like, a hunger, for this improvising thing. And it, uh, it's obviously the biggest makeup is jazz, uh, and that's why I formed my little Steve Howe trio with my son Dylan. How and, and Ross Stanley. But similarly, my exploration for music is now 12, 12 CDs of solo work long, and now I release Time this year, which is a, a different kind of record that's orchestral. But even on there, in the Vivaldi piece, is some improvisation. Uh, some of it is written from improvisation. But there again, with Bach, you just say, Bark, I will play you the way you wrote this. So there are times just to acknowledge the sheer perfection. Like I was saying about the way that Yes created some of our pieces, were very perfectionistic, so why change it? You know, we looked upon what we were doing as more as if we were an orchestra playing, you know, modern classical music, I suppose, um, rather than people who were just generating, um, you know, three-minute pop songs that, that, that came and went. So, um, although we didn't exactly know what, what we were doing, we, you know, it turned out that that's what we were, were doing later on when you look back. was a kind of a, a growing um, idea that you know that you could actually write songs you know I think pro before the Beatles and before Lennon and McCartney I think there were Tempanelli songwriters and and if you were an artist you go there you know if you were Cliff Richard or you know, Tommy Steele's and you go to get a song from you know like a professional publishing house and, and the idea of writing it yourself wasn't really there at all. When I was 17, 
after playing the guitar for uh, four years, uh, I'd had Burns and I'd had an Antorian. I'd started on a, an arch, uh, uh, sorry, uh, an arch top guitar with F holes. And I said to my parents, you know, I, I, I need to have a great guitar. So in 1964, uh, we, we went to Selmis in Chancro Street and bought this marvellous guitar, the ES-175D, that I play on this mostly. And th that guitar, I still play it now, and it's still the most precious guitar I have. I only play it in the UK now at, on tour because, you know, all these other countries have got too many hiccups and glitches about whether you can do that, whether you can do this, whether you've got the paperwork for that. So that guitar has been my sound. I didn't know it at the time, that's why on this film you might see me playing other big fat guitars because I was looking for a sound, I already had it. So later on in the 70s I realised I don't need to keep looking, don't need to keep buying, that's the guitar. So it, it served incredibly well, I love it, adore it. Once it's been told I slept with it. That was only because I was so scared in New York, the first time I went to New York, it was terrifying. We had a hotel next to a fire station in the middle of the night. You can imagine what happened, a fire station. <laughs> you weren't used to New York. You weren't used to the madness. The people in the street all looked so gruesome. And there were people, pimps, prostitutes. It was horrible. It was a horrible area we were in. And uh, my sisters, my, my daughters rather, lo love New York. So they'll be horrified to see me say that. But in 1971, boy. So um, it went in bed, you know, just for safety. I just needed it to know that it was there. But yeah, my parents helped me buy that and, and, and I love it dearly. And it sounds just great. It, it, you know, it, you know, I, sometimes I just use the front pickup and just plug it straight in things and play. People go, that's a great sound. So in other words, it carries the sound. I love that guitar. I love guitar collecting. And you know, eventually I was using more steel guitars, uh, mandolins, Acoustic obviously became very important when we did Roundabout because actually, you know, that was quite brave. That there weren't many rock bands who, who had an acoustic player doing acoustic. So I, I love the colour, the texture and the stylistic possibilities of the guitar. They're so enormous. It allows your personality to enter into the forum as well, which is quite remarkable. <laughs> The creative process to me is actually a fascinating thing and a lot of people talk as if it's something you're either born with or, or you're not. There's nothing you can do to enhance your creative ability. But actually I think, it's, I think that's wrong. I think um, the way we think affects our ability to be creative, proves or it hinders it. And um, the challenge for me is how to take your mind out of the equation. I had an experience when I was in my first years at art school. Uh, I had flu or something, and I was at home working. And while I was working, I was drawing something, a piece of wood, it doesn't really matter. I'm gonna ramble a bit, you're gonna have to cut this, but I'll just, it'll just get me started. I had to draw this piece of wood, and I was used to working in a 45 minute or 90 minute segment, school, curriculum is broken up into those kind of periods and when you go to art school it's the same pretty much you have 90 minute or 45 minute chunks but I'm at home and I'm working and I'm listening to the radio and I'm drawing away I don't have the energy to go anywhere to get food or anything I just sit there listening fascinated with whatever's going on on the radio it's mostly sound stories news it's not music and I'm drawing and I'm drawing for hours, and when I've been drawing for four or five hours, I sh I'm thinking I should do other sketches, but I can't be bothered. I carry on working on that one. And by the time I've been doing it for eight, ten, in fact, more than ten hours by the time I finish it, I'm astounded by what it looks like. It looks amazing. I, it's, it's like if I'd seen that the day before, I couldn't have believed I would have been capable of it. And I learned some great lessons from that, actually. The three lessons I learned was that you have to put in the time. There's no way around putting in the time. Um, 
It's the same with playing a piano or playing guitar. You can't do it immediately. No matter how talented you are, you have to practice. And a piece that benefits from the effort really benefits. But the second lesson was that the radio took my mind off what I was doing. And that allowed all the training I had to just get on with the job. And I find to this day that um, far from it being hard to do things, two things at once, it's actually essential to do two things at once. You cannot concentrate on drawing or painting. It's like running down the stairs. If you're thinking where you're going to put your foot, you're going to trip and fall and break your neck. But at the same time, you have to be aware because somebody's left a suitcase on the staircase, you're going to fall and break your neck if you're not aware. So it's a, the trick is to be aware and not focus or concentrate on what you're doing. So in the process, in the craft of making and creating, I found it very important to be able to take that anxious, busy, thinking part of my mind out of the equation. It allowed all the knowledge and experience I had to get to work without interruption. And I found very similar thing with having ideas. Anxiety, oh my God, what am I gonna do, is the killer of ideas. Really what you do need is, is a sense of trust and, and, and peace, and they do come. It's a, it's a very corny idea, but they do come, and you have to trust that they will come. Um, I, I first learned this lesson, actually, from a musician called Ramesses. He made an album called Space Hymns, and he was one of the few, not the only one, but one of the very few people who came to me with an idea. And I was essentially just his craftsman. I executed it. But he had a good idea, and I liked it. But while he was briefing me on that very first day we met, he was talking to a journalist, and the journalist said to him, Ramesses, where do you get your ideas from? And he said, well, I sit here like this, and when I'm feeling quiet, they come from over here. <laughs> and I thought, very funny, and the journalist laughed. And I knew, though, that there was such a truth in that, that although it sounded like a joke, it was really how it happened. So I, I find it a very important part of the process to make space in my mind. You know, I've got a dog, I've got a big German Shepherd, and I walk him every day. I do try and find half an hour of every day. I don't know whether you call it meditation or prayer, but whatever it is, the point of what it is, is, is to clean, reboot the mind. And it does, it, it, it does help work. And I, so it's, it's part of the creative process and it's part, part of the craft and physical process. There have been changes uh, in our own personnel over the years, but yes, there's always been a combination of the people who are in it. And, um, and it always seems to have come up with a slightly different uh, approach from the mainstream at the time, whatever the time was. Yes, there's always been a bit of a hodgepodge of a um, mixture of talent, in a way. I mean, when John and I first started the band, you know, we, we had a, an idea that we, you know, that we, were, we loved um, Simon and Garfunkel and, and the Fifth Dimension, I think, at that time was a, was a big uh, thing for us because of the harmonies and, uh, and uh, the way, you know, they put together uh, the, their music and and so the idea of yes the blueprint for yes really was to have a band that had great vocals but then also that you know the, the players were going to be more than just functional behind you know we wanted the playing the playing to be really good too yes was made up of people who not only were a great team together and had this terrific chemistry but every one of us believe me was like thinking 
yeah, but this is a stepping stone to assert my, my situation, my, my career as a guitarist, John's as a singer, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I don't think there was any secret about that, but we all love working together, but also, come 75, we all went off and did a solo album, and some, since then, many of us, uh, with, you know, with degrees of, of numbers, have, have done the solo albums, and, uh, you know, that's been an exploratory area that, that I couldn't live without, personally. Partly because I play solo guitar, which is something that is driving me forwards and, you know, involving that a little as I do in live shows with bands and in my own solo releases. I enjoy it very much and it's very much a very focused part of my musical output. While groups just kind of come along, what have you got, Steve? Oh, I've got a song over here, I've got this tune, I've got this good riff. And you just kind of throw stuff in and it becomes part of the mix. While solo guitar playing is very much about a concerted effort to stay on your course, about finding how you're going to technically do this, how you're going to support your the parts, how the melody is going to come through, how you're going to arrange it. That's all left to me and I'm quite happy with that. You know, whenever a slot came open for a, you know, a new member, for instance, Steve Howe, to come in when uh, Peter Banks didn't really agree with the direction that John and I wanted to go in, especially on the second album where we wanted to use an orchestra and guitarists hate the hearing anyone else in the band saying, let's use an orchestra because I think they think the violins are going to steal their thunder or something. Steve came in, uh, but you know, when I'd seen Steve play around uh, London clubs and uh, Speakeasy with his band Bodast, and of course I'd seen him before in his band Tomorrow, but, which were a pretty big psychedelic band. And um, so I sort of went after him, sort of headhunted him. And you know, and I did the same thing with Rick Waitman too, when. Um, uh, you know, Tony Kay and Steve uh, sort of fell out on our first American tour and uh, you know it didn't seem like there was going to be a relationship that was easily going to be mended so so Tony uh, went out and uh, and you know once again I had hunted Rick Wakeman I remember I had to you know, almost beg him to come and try <laughs> try out and when he got there he was like oh yes I really like this so <laughs> Oh, I'm not jumping around quite as, as much as I was then, but uh, I still enjoy playing live a lot. Um, and um, yeah, no, I, I still, uh, it's one of my favorite things to actually do a live show. And, uh, you know, it's very, uh, it's very energizing and it's, uh, it's great to play to people uh, who, uh, especially people who really enjoy the music of the band and you, gave, you get great feedback from them and, you know, it's um, oh, it's become something that you know is a big part of my life, and I'm happy it is. Recently, we've uh, we have a new singer. I have done for the last three years, and I found him on YouTube in a Yes tribute band in, in Montreal. The listening experience is amazing. I know a lot of people you know, are very upset that John isn't with them anymore. And I don't really want to go into that. This, this is really, you know, between them and John. And John not being well. But I, I've heard the new lineup play, and uh, if you can live with the notion that John isn't there, the musical experience is fabulous.
seeing them on the road is really hearing the music. And, and that changes too. I mean, um, Tales from Topographic Oceans had the advantage of them being able to perfect a very complex piece of music in the studio. So when, you, when that album came out, it was complex and it was a studio album and it worked. But when it was on the road at first, there was a tightness, you know, the, the, there was a focus on getting it right. It was very complicated, very big piece of music. And I think the band, as it were, was trying very hard to get it right. And unfortunately, you were aware of this effort to perform that complex piece of music. And the reason I feel like I can say that is that many years later when I heard them play it again, it was fabulous because they completely embraced it. They, they were so aware of it and so knew it, they didn't have to think about it. They could just perform and they performed with a grace and fluidity that suddenly I thought, my God, this is actually a brilliant piece of music. I guess if you don't die, 30, 40 years of practice means that you become much, much, much better. And I, I think that's true, actually. I think yes today are way better than yes the back then. But the thing about yes in 73 was that it was astonishing. You know, it's, it was a surprise as well as a brilliant performance. Now here we are, 2011, we're saying, all these changes and formats and laser discs and all these things that have happened, finally, we, you know, we, get, we get, to, get to see it on DVD. So I say bravo, about time. Maybe, you know, a few decades late, but here we are. Ciao!